But I'd like to welcome you to today's discovery lecture series featuring Dr. James Matisoff. He is an authority on Southeast Asian linguistics, especially on the diverse community groups of languages from the Tibeto Burman family. And today he'll discuss linguistics field investigations from multiple travels over there. So while he is speaking, if you have any questions for Dr. Matisoff, feel free to post them in the chat and we'll get to these towards the end of the presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Matisoff to UNT. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you all virtually this afternoon. Uh, Chopina has encouraged me to reminisce and tell a few anecdotes about my early fieldwork experiences. So I've selected about a dozen of them. Uh, a few of them are a bit gross. So uh, let me apologize in advance if I offend anyone's sensibilities. But uh, first, a little introduction. In the summer of 1963, when I was a grad student in linguistics at Berkeley, the chair of the linguistics department, Professor Mary Haas, was contacted by a grad student at the University of Arizona named Leroy Moran, who wanted to work with a linguist on his native language, Kachin or Jingpa, as it's called nowadays, an important uh, Tibetan Burman language of Northern Burma. Ms. Haas knew that I was interested in Japanese and Chinese and suggested that I work with him uh, that summer. So Leroy and I had a lot of fun working that for a couple of months that summer. He turned out to be a fabulous informant, a consultant. Uh, one thing we did was translate Waya Zhao's Mandarin Primer into Jingpo. And Leroy eventually became a professor of linguistics himself at the University of Indiana. Now, by happy coincidence, Professor Wallace Chafe had chosen Burmese as the language of his field methods course in 1963-64. Now, in this class, I began to sense that it might be interesting to find cognates between Jingpa and Burmese. In 1957, the Soviets had launched Sputnik and the US government was worried that we were falling behind on the world stage, linguistically as well as technologically. This led to the creation of the National Defense Foreign Language Fellowship Program under which almost anyone who wanted to study an exotic language uh, could be funded. In 1964, I was awarded such a grant to do fieldwork on Jingpa in Burma. But 1964 was the year that all foreigners were expelled from Burma. China was not an option since it was in the throes of the Cultural Revolution. What to do? Professor Haas, my advisor, who was an authority on Thai as well as on American Indian languages, suggested that I try to have my grant move to Thailand. To cover all the bases, I changed my application to say I'd be studying quote, Miao, Yao, Lahu, and or Wa. I was rather ambitious. I did get the grant and soon decided that the language I should work on was Lahu, thus committing myself to Tibetan Burman studies. In due course, I set off for Thailand with my wife, Susan, and our nine month old baby, Nadia, which show the first uh, PowerPoint thing now. Uh, we didn't feel secure about living in a hill tribe village with such a small child. So we decided to live in Chiang Mai from where I could make periodic trips to Lahu land. When we first arrived in Chiang Mai in 1965, it was a small city of about 60,000 people with a tiny expatriate community that consists mostly, mostly of anthropologists, linguists, missionaries, diplomats, and military advisors. Just about every foreigner was acquainted with all the others. On the main drag, Ta Pao Road, there was an establishment called Tantrapan, which was like a small department store with a second floor reached by an escalator. These, there, foreigners would shop for Western goodies like canned cheese, imported mostly from Australia. That was where I would buy my Burmese charuts as well. Since the tap water in Thailand was not drinkable, we would buy soda water, nam soda in Thai, by the case and have it delivered to our house. Our housekeeper, a lovely woman named Kama, made the best curries I've ever had. Every day she would ask me what kind of curry I wanted for dinner. The options were beef, pork, chicken, shrimp, fish, all of them totally delicious. One day I had trouble choosing and said I wanted gang malang mum, 
spider curry. Kamal found this to be incredibly amusing and never got tired of the joke. She coached Susan on how to bargain with the merchants in the market and told everybody there to be nice and fair to her since she was a good foreign lady. As luck would have it, soon after our arrival in Chiang Mai, I ran across a young Lahu, originally from Shan State in Burma, who lived in Chiang Mai and whose English was quite good. His Lahu name was Jalo, but he also went by the English name of Paul, which had been given to him by Catholic missionaries in Burma. His parents had died when he was nine years old, so he was raised in a Shan family and his Lahu had grown quite rusty. I had been advised that I should work on the black Lahu dialect, Lahu Na, which everybody agreed was the standard. However, most of the Lahu in Thailand were red Lahu or Lahu Nyi. An exception was the village of Hue Ta, located in the Nikom or Hill Tribe Resettlement Center about 60 kilometers north of Chiang Mai. It was populated by recent black Lahu Christian refugees from Shan State who had recently been induced to move to Thailand by Baptist missionaries. Every couple of weeks, Jalo and I would stop at the large Chang Puk market on the northern, end of, uh, northern edge of Chiang Mai to stock up on treats for the Hue Tat villagers, candy and chewing gum for the kids, dried meats, eggs, Burmese cheroots for the grown-ups. I would pack a canteen for water, a blanket, flashlight batteries, toilet paper, toothpicks, a mat, a towel, insect repellent, and so forth. We would then board a bus for Chengdao, about 60 kilometers to the north, from where we trudge up a mountain with backpacks and tape recorder for about three hours before reaching the village. This was tough in the rainy season. After eliciting for a few days, we'd return to Chiang Mai to transcribe and translate what we had recorded. There were many words and expressions that Jalaw didn't understand at first, but we figured them out on the next trip to the village. The scenery on the way up to Twisty Mountain Road was spectacular. Range upon range of thickly wooded hills, the most distant ones bluish and hazy, valleys cross-cut with streams, the broad leaves of banana plants jostling with stands of bamboo of all shapes and sizes, great trees festooned with vines, the earth a bright reddish brown from its high iron content. My very first visit to Hui Tat went quite well after Jalla explained while we were there. The pastor of the village, a gaunt, serious man named Jabu, simply said, we will help you. I launched into the first elicitation session, starting with parts of the body, asking them to repeat each word three times. When we got to the word for index finger, I was surprised by people's reactions, since everybody, including Jabo, began giggling at the threefold repetition of no, no, no. I soon found out that it literally meant dog shit finger, apparently because of its size and shape. This broke the ice and everybody relaxed for the rest of the elicitation. Of course, all this was years before the advent of computers. All I had was a heavy reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, piles of homemade file slips, carbon paper, and colored pens. My tapes were not a very good sound quality since there were many background noises like rice pounding, cocks crowing, dogs barking, kids crying. Naturally, I had no sophisticated audio-visual equipment and wouldn't have known how to use it even if I had. The carbon paper was used to, be in create, to begin creating both a Lahu English an English Lahu slip file for my eventual dictionary. After a while, I prevailed upon Susan to refile the carbons of my Lahu slips in the alphabetical order of their English classes. By the way, what are file slips anyway? Today's students hardly know. They're now called something like memo slips in stationary stores. Huaitat was then a small village of about 25 houses. You might show the uh, uh, bird's eye view of Huaitat, that's number 10. Um, there was an ingenious system of split bamboo aqueducts to channel water from the stream. Since it was a Christian village, no opium was cultivated, just rice, which they ate unheld, supplemented by bananas, chili peppers, tea, and a little maize. In the months that followed, I was astounded by the ingenuity of the pedagogical techniques that the Huaitat villagers developed for my benefit. 
In order to collect vocabulary from as wide a range of situational contexts as possible, I would suggest certain topics for discussion, building a house, stages in the cultivation of rice, boar hunting, the New Year's celebration, gathering crabs, killing a pig for a feast, the institution of the village headman, and so forth. The villagers would then talk over the subject and actually conduct rehearsals, assigning specific roles to various people until they felt they could talk about it smoothly. When they were ready, they'd signal me to turn on the tape recorder and proceed to act out little playlets on the desired topic, complete with sound effects like gunshots and animal noises. I must admit, that I sometimes would turn on the tape recorder before they realized it to get even more natural conversation. Besides these group efforts, many individuals offered to perform for the tape recorder by themselves, often inspired by a theme that someone else had just introduced. One day, a joke was told that revolved around a misunderstanding between a black lahu and a yellow lahu. In short order, several other people produced such jokes, sometimes between two lahu who spoke different dialects, and sometimes between a lahu and a shan. Similarly, one someone told a sexy trickster story, others vied to chime in with such stories of their own. To call these villagers informants now sounds rather disrespectful with unwelcome law enforcement overtones. Nowadays, consultants or even teachers is preferable. The usual Chinese term now seems to be fai yin ren, uh, pronunciation people. I'm going to say a few words about special elicitation techniques. Uh, one day, walking through the jungle, I heard a piercing repeated bird call, E flat, C, D, C. When I got to Hui Tat, I imitated the cry and asked if they knew what bird that was. Somebody immediately piped up, Kappa Metsuchakui yo. I had taken the bird guide of Thailand to the village and showed them the pictures. They soon found it in the bird book, and it turned out to be the greater bracket-tailed drongo, Dicorus paradisius, a species with an extravagantly long tail. A color terminology. I already suspected that there would be no problem with white, black, red, and yellow, but I was fairly sure that other distinctions I was, I was used to making in English might have no direct Lahu equivalents. Sure enough, blue and green were considered shades of the same color, and there were no Lahu words that covered the same range as English, orange, brown, or purple. I took color swatches to the village and had them try to contrast pairs like sky color versus leaf color. They came up with all kinds of names for what they considered different shades of the same color. Try asking an English speaker what the differences are among, for example, crimson, vermilion, burgundy, and scarlet. Nobody's gonna agree. Asking for repetitions. It turned out to be important to learn the most natural way of asking for a repetition, like English, huh? To painfully ask something like, what did you say? Would invite the speaker to say the same thing in different words. But if you say, huh, with a nasal, with automatic nasalization of the vowel after the laryngeal initial, you'd get an exact repetition. It took me quite a while to realize this, since the falling tone of, huh, seems very definite, not interrogative. Finally, a word about Lahu as a lingua franca, a common language among other tribal groups. A fringe benefit from making Lahu my language of study was the fact that it was, it is something of a lingua franca with respect to Aka and Nyan. I later found out that some Wa in China use Lahu too. Some of my most enjoyable experiences were talking Lahu with non-Lahu because then my interlocutor was in the same boat as me. Okay, now for some anecdotes. Harrowing bus trips. Bus drivers would often play chicken with buses coming from the opposite direction uh, or would try to pass another vehicle going in the same direction to see who would swerve first on the narrow roads. This made for tense trips. Once I couldn't take it anymore and asked to be let off in the middle of nowhere. The buses were always crowded with huge loads of ice, animals in cages, and people on the roof. Often I'd have to sit with my legs straight out in front of me on top of the burlap bags covered, covering the ice. Occasionally I'd be allowed to sit up front next to the driver, unless there was a monk on board who naturally had priority. 
These buses were indirectly responsible for the death of three Jinu Be that I was intending to take back to Chiang Mai to show people. A Jinu Be is a shiny blue-green millipede that rolls into a snail-like ball when touched, but opens up again when exposed to fire, like the tip of a cigarette. On two separate occasions, the Jinu Be in my pocket were crushed by fellow passengers on the bus. The third time, I had foolishly put it into my back pocket and sat on it all the way back to Chiang Mai. Flogging in Fang. Fang, 128 kilometers north of Chiang Mai, was a tough town in those days, a center of the heroin refining business run by Chinese middlemen who bought the raw opium for a pittance from the hill tribes and paid protection to the KMT, the Kuomintang, who had taken refuge in Thailand after the communist takeover. By the time the heroin reached Bangkok, it had multiplied vastly in price. I once saw quite a sight by the road as I passed through Fang on the bus. A guy with disheveled long hair, stripped to the waist and tied down over a stump, being flogged by a man in uniform. Next, botched killing of a pig. As an expression of gratitude to the Hui Tat villagers, I would sometimes pay for a pig to be slaughtered and shared by the whole village. Meat was a real treat for the villagers since they raised pigs to sell and only ate pork a couple of times a year at the New Rice Festival in the fall and at New Year's. They would divide up the meat with mathematical precision, apportioning it to each household by laying it out on banana leaves. When given enough time, they could prepare quite tasty dishes, soups, meatballs, stir fries with the meat chopped up together with the bones, using every conceivable part of the animal, featuring their universal quartet of spices, salt, garlic, ginger, hot chilies. The bones were eagerly chewed up for much needed nutrients. Especially prized was the intestine, a long squiggly affair that had to be carefully washed. As patron of the feast, I would be pressed to eat huge amounts. Somebody once said, dig in until your lips and beard are dripping with pork fat. Yet there were misadventures as well. Unlike chickens, pigs are smart. They know very well when their end is near and put up a horrible squealing as the knife approaches. Once this so rattled the executioner that his, life, his knife missed the heart so that the poor pig redoubled his struggles. It finally had to be dispatched by pouring boiling water down his throat. Meanwhile, the main concern of the bystanders was to catch in bowls every drop of blood that dripped from the multiple wounds for later use in the soup. Brushing teeth on the veranda. One morning, as I was brushing my teeth on the veranda of Pastor Jabot's house, I must have made a false step on the split bamboo flooring because most of the veranda gave way, slowly taking me down five feet to the ground with my toothbrush still in my hand, apparently with a pricelessly bewildered expression on my face. Trying to suppress his amusement, Jabot took me to the stream to wash up. Crossing log bridges over streams above jagged rocks. On walks through the jungle, one frequently encountered streams that could only be crossed by a bridge consisting of a log that would roll ominously from side to side as one stepped on it. The stream itself would usually be full of jagged rocks. My Lahu friends would calmly walk across in their bare, callous, thickened feet, feet or in flip-flops and take off along the path, leaving me there. The only way I dared cross was by scooching myself along on my butt like an inchworm and hastening to catch up to the others. In Lahu agriculture, no shoes needed. Sometimes even sandals were too much and I should just have gone barefoot myself. On one of my brief trips in the 1990s, I was allowed to help with planting a few rows of some kind of seeds, trying to wade through the thick mud with my flip-flops getting sucked off every few seconds. My Lahu co-workers were of course barefoot Although this was among the easiest of the tasks in the agricultural cycle, compared, for example, to burning the fields, felling trees, or hacking away at underbrush with machetes, I was exhausted after about 25 minutes. Everybody was kind enough to praise my efforts, saying that the seeds I planted would grow especially well. This reminds me of the time I took Paul Benedict to Hoi Tha. Afterwards, he claimed to everybody that he had, he had helped to build a Lahu house when all he had done was to touch the end of the ridge, ridge pole that was about to be 
hoisted onto the roof. Building a house in Huaytad is the uh, second of, of these uh, uh, PowerPoint slides. Okay, now we get to excretory adventures. There were no toilet facilities in Huaytad in those days. Once I desperately had to pee in the middle of the night. In order not to wake anybody by fumbling with a complicated bamboo latch on the door in the pitch dark, I managed to find a hole in a split bamboo floor, just big enough for me to pee through by lying on top of it on my belly, petrified that the noise of the drip would awaken somebody. Another time, I had started to pee off the side of the veranda of somebody's house, when all of a sudden a cow that had been hanging out under the house appeared and opened its mouth wide to catch the stream, its tongue lolling from side to side in pure sensual pleasure at the nutritious treat. Most challenging was having to defecate in the woods, followed by an appreciative retinue of dogs and or pigs. It was a good idea to take a stout stick along to discourage too close an approach by the hungry animals. Now a word about opium. I once accepted my friend Ingelil Hansen's invitation to visit her non-Christian Aka village, since I was eager to see what opium smoking was all about. The head man was an abiding fellow and a fluent Lahu speaker. He had me lie down on a mat beside him with a little kerosene lamp between us. First, he ground up a few aspirin tablets to a powder. He then melted a small bar of opium over the lamp, mixing it with some of the aspirin and stuffing it into a pipe. Apparently, the aspirin is thought to make the opium more effective. I accepted the smoldering pipes one after the other, enjoying the interesting smell and taste. At first, I felt nothing and kept asking for more until I had smoked about 20 pipes full. Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Several hours of hallucinations and nausea followed. I decided it wasn't worth it and did not become an addict. Now, eclipses. At one point, I was laid low by dengue fever in Chiang Mai with a temperature of 104 degrees, 40 degrees Celsius, the highest fever I had ever experienced. In the middle of the day, as I was tossing and turning in my bed, the room suddenly went dark and I thought I must be dying. Fortunately, Susan soon returned from the market all excited. Did you see it? She asked. See what? The total eclipse of the sun. Somehow the topic of eclipses arose on a subsequent field trip as I was visiting a Lahu speaking Mian village. I thought I should try to explain the phenomenon to them. So I took a kerosene lamp to represent the sun, a large orange to represent the earth, and a small tangerine to be the moon. First, I showed how the orange revolved around the kerosene lamp and how the tangerine revolved around the orange. Things then got complicated as I tried to show how these heavenly bodies interfered with each other. My audience was attentive at first, but then their eyes glazed over. They were polite, but obviously didn't believe a word I was saying since they already knew the real cause of eclipses. According to the Lahu, solar eclipses are caused by a tiger eating the sun, while lunar eclipses are due to a frog eating the moon. The men explanation is similar to the Lahu one. A word about the outside world. The outside world sometimes impinged on my innocent linguistic work. Every so often, when I'd be traveling in the hills alone, I'd encounter some Thai members of the border police who wanted to know what I was doing. I would flash them my name card with my academic affiliations on it, and they'd usually offer me some lukewarm Mekong whiskey and Sprite, a cocktail which I would gladly accept, which reassured them that I was a fine fellow. Mekong whiskey is an acquired taste. It's usually aged for about three days before being bottled. We wanderers in the hills were actually prized as potential intelligence assets. During the July 4th, 1966 festivities at the American consulate, I was asked by a CIA type if I'd noticed any, quote, unusual movements near my village. In general, we were blissfully unaware of the details of the Indo-Chinese war, which was then relatively limited to resisting the Patet Lao in Laos. We got Newsweek once a week, so we did know that something ominous was brewing. Now I'd like to fast forward to changes in Lahu life observed on subsequent trips. I've been back to Lahu land many times since my first three long field trips in the 60s and 70s, most recently in 2017. 
the changes in Lahu life have been profound. Chiang Mai is now a metropolis of nearly 150,000, the third biggest city in Thailand, with an international airport and over 30,000 foreigners year round. Even Hue Tat is now so big that five pigs might not be enough to feed the whole village. What about missionary activities? Christianity is now flourishing among the hill tribes at the expense of animism. Missionaries have certainly brought about many positive changes, including improved personal hygiene, the introduction of better breeds of domestic animals, and somewhat better medical care. In 2013, I visited an impressive addiction rehabilitation center run by the Church of Christ. The missionaries have <clears throat> introduced a celebration of Christmas into the Lahu calendar, but to their credit, they have left the two major uh, pre-Christian holidays intact the harvest celebration of the, in the fall called Jasuo, and the lengthy New Year's festivities. A cultural plus is the introduction of choral music, so that when strolling through a village, one can often hear the strains of hymns in four-part harmony being rehearsed for performance in church on the next Sunday. On the other hand, it is disheartening to see doctrinal disputes between Western religions being disputes between Western religions being imported to the hill tribes. The most contentious issue is birth control with the Baptists and the Catholics taking predictably different viewpoints. The well-meaning missionary linguist Paul Lewis has been cruelly accused of genocide for promoting voluntary contraception among the Aka and Lahu. In 2003, I had the moving experience of visiting a village called Tat Mok that was undergoing the final stages of conversion to Christianity with two thirds of the village having already taken the plunge. The animus priest in his eighties and almost stone deaf had been obliged to close down the building that had been used as a temple or hoye, moving the ritual objects that remained into his own house where services were still occasionally held though more and more rarely. A word about te technological advances. My last several trips to Hue Tat in the 21st century were surprising in terms of technological progress. The village now boasts a row of flushable public toilets. One of my chief consultants, Yapae, actually has a toilet inside his house. The village is now electrified. Some people have shortwave radios. Many have television sets and other audiovisual equipment, allowing them to play Lahu videotapes produced in Burma. No longer do the villagers have to rely on pine torches or akutje to get around at night, since flashlights are now universal. Livelihood. Lahu men have traditionally prided themselves on their hunting skills. By now, however, all big game in Thailand have long ago been hunted to extinction, so that nothing is left except frogs, squirrels, and the occasional bird. The demise of the uh, large game animals, by the way, is indirectly due to uh, World War II, when the hill tribes in the north of Thailand and Laos were issued guns to defend themselves against uh, invasion. And they kept the guns after the war and used them to slaughter all, all the animals uh, around. Young people are now forsaking the arduous labor involved in rice cultivation in favor of jobs down in the plains for which they receive monetary wages. This development has been hastened by overpopulation in the hills, which has made it increasingly difficult to find a new field to cultivate where the old one gives out and must lie fallow. The use of the rather violent term slash and burn has concealed the fact that such cultivation is actually ecologically righteous if population pressure is not too great, so that there is land available to move a village to a new location every several years. In addition to rice, tea and coffee plantations have now sprung up in the hills, often owned by Chinese refugees from the communist regime. Women's handicrafts have become more and more important as a source of income. In the past, the beautifully embroidered shoulder bags and michaw were easily to be found in the villages, and I would buy several of them during each visit. By the late 1970s, they were all ordered in advance by shops in Chiang Mai and abroad, and were modified to appeal to the international market, often with zippers and snaps, secret compartments, and a greater variety in patterns and colors. One wonders whether the pandemic has ruined this source of income. 
a word about the Lahu language as time has gone on. Inevitably, large swaths of traditional vocabulary have been lost to the younger generations of Lahu. After a couple of years of primary education in the village, the children of Huaytat are now being educated in Thai schools and cheerfully tromp up and down the trail from the village to the school in the plains five days a week. On the lexical level, the names of plants and fungi in the woods are being forgotten. Which species of mushrooms are eligible? Which plants have healing properties? The young folks don't know. The tradition of Lahu courtship poetry is practically dead. The poems used to be chanted antiphonally by the young men and women of the village. They are full of striking set expressions and vivid images. The meanings of many of these expressions were already obscure in the 1960s, and young people were no longer expected to memorize the hundreds of verses involved. <clears throat> Some idea of the beauty of this poetry can be gathered from the English translation of Song of the Lahu Love Me in Harold Young's 2013 book. Thanks to the British anthropologist, Anthony R. Walker, who worked for five consecutive years with animist Red Lahu in Thailand, there is a large corpus of animist religious texts available for study. Before he published these texts, Walker kindly let me copy all of them from his field notes in 1977 so that I could extract the vocabulary from my dictionary. The motto of all salvage linguists, if we can't save the language, at least let us record it. Nevertheless, Lahu, like all languages, has the resilience to create neologisms from pre-existing lexical material. For example, the expression is used to mean to fight a guerrilla war, from ka to steal or do something stealthily, and ba to shoot or fight. The word for cell phone is now lache to lasha. Lache means hand, and to lasha is telephone, which derives from Thai and ultimately from Pali Sanskrit. So uh, languages renew themselves uh, constantly if they're given half a chance. Word about drugs. Opium is no longer safely grown in the hills because of international efforts to stamp it out. This has had unfortunate unintended consequences since it has led to the massive importation of the far more dangerous methamphetamines from Burma. With good reason, the Thai refer to methamphetamine as yaba, literally crazy making drug. Both meth and heroin are now easily obtainable in Thailand, not typically taken by injection. Monetization of the hill tribes in Thailand. Until the pandemic took hold in Thailand a few years ago, there were regular shows for tourists in Chiang Mai, featuring people from the various hill tribes who were called upon to sing and dance with them, rather like exhibits in a zoo. There are now regular guided tours to certain hill tribe villages where the residents have learned to dress up in, tra in traditional garb and ask the tourists for money in exchange for having their photos taken. Okay, cautionary tales, post fieldwork disasters. I would like to finish with a couple of cautionary tales demonstrating that one should never assume one's fieldwork is over until it's brought safely home. In the 1980s, my friend Elaine Marlowe Kaufman had completed arduous fieldwork on the Ibibio language of Nigeria <clears throat> and had created an Ibibio English dictionary. After arriving back safely to New York, she took a train to Washington, DC and fell asleep exhausted during the trip. When she awoke, she discovered that her suitcase with the dictionary manuscript has been, had been stolen. Eventually she had to return to Nigeria and redo the dictionary, which she did. More personally, returning to the US after my first field trip in 1966, Susan, Nadia, and I were picked up at the San Francisco airport by her brother, <coughs> also called Jim. He was driving a little Volkswagen bug, but had neglected to bring ropes to fashion my suitcase onto the car roof. On the freeway, my suitcase flew off onto the road with all my tapes inside. We stopped traffic and threw the tapes into a quilt. The tapes were then eventually restored by the wizards in the Berkeley Language Laboratory. This year, I'm glad to say that the arc of my work on Lahu is finally coming to a conclusion. The texts I recorded in the 60s and 70s are soon to be published electronically, all 1,221 pages of them, accompanied by audio files with printed versions available on demand. The home for these texts is, of course, Professor Chalia's wonderful Corsal project. Thanks to you all for keeping me company down memory lane. Okay, all done.
Thank you so much, Dr. Matisoff. Um, and Shobana is going to facilitate our Q&A right now. So if anybody has questions, feel free to jump on your camera. Or okay, can I take questions. a little break? Yep. One second, I'll be right back. Intermission. So meanwhile, please think of your questions and we'll answer those in just a minute. You're welcome to post them in the chat or jump on camera. Um, Is anybody surprised by something you heard here today? <laughs> spider curry? <laughs> would you try it? The spider curry? Uh, I'm not sure. I would run from a spider for sure. But then to try to eat that, I'm not, yeah. Um, but I did put, uh, uh, reposted in the chat, the link to the text collection that, um, that Dr. Matisoff mentioned. And if Mary is here, is Mary Burke here? Hi. Hi, Mary. So when when uh, Jim comes back, do you want to uh, say something about the tech, the where the audio files are, and how they're linked to the text, the yeah, text collection? Yeah. yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I'll post a link to in the in the chat here. Yeah, that would be good. Um, I thought it was funny he mentioned the um, the headman was very kind of a stern guy because you can hear it if you listen to the audio you can hear he's a very serious person <laughs> is that right okay in some of them yeah when you can hear right. i'll send a link fantastic so jim thank you so much for um for sharing those uh um that walk down memory lane with us i understand you're actually working on your memoirs right now and I think at one point we were talking and you said that uh, you had only gotten through about about two or three years and you were 100 or 200 pages in. I don't remember what it was, but it seemed like it was going to be at least a couple of thousand pages before you were done. Well, How's that going? I hope I have about 300 pages now. I'm on beginning chapter eight. I'm taking a little break now. <laughs> um, okay. Ho hopefully it won't take more than another year. Knock on I should have started years ago. Well, I, I'm going to ask a question about that. Um, I see that there's some questions in the chat, too. I'll, I'll, I'll get to them in just a second. I wanted to ask about that. If you were keeping a journal and, um, you know, how do you have such detailed recollections? Is that because you had a journal as you were in the field? Um, not, not exactly, but mm -hmm. uh, I have a pretty good memory. For, for the earlier chapters of my memoirs, I, I did rely on sort of diaries, which I kept, but I stopped doing that when I got to college yeah. yeah 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 I'm always impressed when people do that and I I also forget I start and then I I yeah keeping that the habit is is very difficult uh, a question in in uh in the chat uh Lisa Hollinger says that it was it's very fascinating and it makes her want to live abroad again absolutely uh Gabriella Johnson asks I can't hear you anymore. Something Do you want to ask that again? I believe you froze, Shobana. Oh, okay. All right. Um, the question was if you could uh, talk about how, what, what are some of the other changes in village life and how have those changes impacted language? I think you talked about um, some of the, you know, the people forgetting some of the terms in the, in the poetic language and some new words coming in. Are there other changes that you see? Well, yeah, the technological ones that, um, as I said, they, they now can get videotapes from Burma and uh, they now have electricity and, and uh, you know, sanitation facilities. And uh, on the other hand, there's uh, more and more pressure uh, because of overpopulation and they're no longer able to change the location of the village every few years. The so-called slash and burn as I uh, mentioned briefly, is actually ecologically righteous because what they would do is uh, cultivate the same plots of land uh, for a couple of years. And when the fertility was uh, wearing out, they would move to a new place right. and uh, start over. And then they would you know, do a circle. And eventually after 10 or 12 years, or, I mean, I think they'd come back to the original place where they were. But you can't do that anymore because there's there's population pressure from the lowlands. The uh, lowlanders are moving higher and higher up the hills, and there are more and more uh, uh, hill tribes people too, because uh, uh, with better 
uh, uh, medical care and everything. Uh, fewer children are dying in, uh, uh, at an early age and the population is increasing. So um, there are good aspects of that and uh, regrettable aspects too. But we can't, we can't uh, sit in a chair near the uh, end of the, uh, the ocean and like King Canute once did and defy the ocean from coming up to reach him. No, the ocean is going to to uh, uh, inundate you no matter what you do. So the thing is to prepare for it. And uh, I say, if you can't save everything, at least record it. You know? As we all know, uh, half of the languages spoken in the world today are supposed to be extinct by the end of the century, at least half of them. So um, that's our job as salvage linguists. Yep, to, to get a lasting record. So. Um... Kelly Bergson. Oh, oh and there was a, a question here from Harvey Simpson. If there are any photographs available anywhere, uh, any additional photographs, I guess, uh, because um, let me see what else was the rest of this comment. Can you see it, Sandy? Here we go. Yeah, are these photos available anywhere? Um, I'm fascinated by old film photos and the ones on the slideshow are really neat. So are your photographs available anywhere? Well, no, I have a whole box of them. But a, a lot of them are repetitive and not very good. I've had this primitive little camera. Um, but there are books. Uh, I mentioned the linguist Paul Lewis. His, his wife, Elaine Lewis, published a beautiful picture book called From the Hands of the Hills, which mm -hmm. uh, emphasizes uh, women's crafts like uh, embroidering shoulder bags and things like that. Um, and there are also a lot of nice pictures of village life there. Um, I can maybe provide a little bibliography of uh, pictorial works on the, on the, there aren't that many. Okay. But nowadays with modern audiovisual equipment, uh, one, one on my 2015 field trip, I think it was, I went with, uh, I was accompanied by this filmmaker who was very sophisticated with his audiovisual equipment, um, who was very interested in the Young family of missionaries. Their name was Young, Harold Young, Vincent Young, who was starting in the uh, late 19th century. Uh, and uh, we traveled around to lots of villages together in, in Burma, now called Myanmar, which was a lot of fun. Um, what was the point I was making before that? We were talking about the photographs. About, uh, yeah. um, and he, he has bajillions of photographs. And um, uh, he'd be willing to share them, I'm sure. I have some of them on my computer. Yeah, so so Mary Mary and I will make a note to talk to you about your photographs at some point, because there okay. is interest, yeah, and they tell they tell a, a, a very large story too. Um, uh, Kelly, Kelly Brookson, would you like to ask your question? Sure, hi, thank you so much for that talk. Um, it was such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the ways that um, computers and more recording devices, et cetera, change those early stages of documentation. So I feel like we think about um, what we gain from those technologies, but I'm wondering also if you if you think that there are things we lose by relying on that on that tech. That's a good question. Um, my mentor and then advisor Mary Haas used to say there's nothing like writing things down by hand, because that helps you remember them. And uh, in the many years which I taught field methods at Berkeley, uh, we did that. We, uh, in the pre-computer age, everybody wrote everything down and so forth and so on. Then once computers came, people would just type out the, the words into, into the computer, accurately or not. And uh, it would go in one ear and out the other sometimes because uh, there was no labor involved in, in the accordion. So. I don't know if that's a general phenomenon, but it seems to me that's that's what's happening. Thank you. I guess when you're when you're trying to write, then you can you know you can play with a lot of uh, diacritics and so on. But if you're typing, you might just gloss over that, and yeah. there's about not going to bother about quality and so on. Um, right. Okay, so uh, there's a question here about what your plan is, plans are after you've completed your memoir. What what will your next adventure be? <laughs> <laughs> well, at my age, it's an adventure just to stay alive, I guess. But uh, <laughs> I do have various projects. 
of a uh, semantics paper, historical semantics paper for a volume uh, in progress. And uh, well, these memoirs are going to take a long time. So that's, that's going to occupy me for quite a while, I think. I don't know if Leanne Hinton is still on here. She, um, uh, she has been talking with us about writing our memoirs. She um, has, I think, taken... Uh, Leanne, are you still here? Let me see if I can find her. She's, she may have, she may have had to leave. But uh, so we were really, we had a discussion this summer about what it means to write a memoir. And have you, have you been, have you been reading a lot of memoirs? Did you, uh, did you practice a, the genre? Did you write a little bit to practice how to write a memoir? Did you take any classes to do this? Or is it just something where you're writing your recollections and you're just, you're a very good writer, I know. So maybe this was just something that you, you know, you felt very comfortable doing. Yeah, well, as I said, in the early years, starting in uh, junior high school, I think, I kept extensive, not, not exactly diaries and books, but on uh, sheets of scrap paper, which I kept. Mm -hmm. It was kind of amusing in a way because uh, my mother used to uh, try and read them whenever I wrote them. So I, I had to use various codes so she wouldn't uh, understand <laughs> them. So I, I tried writing English and Greek letters, but she figured that out in 10 minutes. So I, uh, I tried writing English in, uh, in Hebrew letters, but my sister ratted me out because she knew Hebrew. Uh, so eventually I learned a system of shorthand, uh, which I wrote the things in. But unfortunately now I can't read much of that myself. I've forgotten the system. So, <laughs> but anyway, that's not a big problem. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Prafula Basumatari. He's, uh, uh, Prafula, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, thank you, um, Dr. Matisov, uh, for your wonderful uh, talk. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I'm a bit curious uh, about uh, to know the other Tibeto Burman languages in the Northeast, uh, especially Borogaro languages. So, is yeah. there any connection uh, uh, in between Lahu and these languages? Oh, yes, sure. It's a rather remote relationship, though. The Bodogaro family is not very close to Lolo Burmese, which Lahu belongs to. So, um, anyway, um, the Tibeto Burman family is incredibly complicated uh, mm -hmm. because there have been lots of migrations of people, lots of language contact, both from the uh, majority languages in the plains and from other uh, minority languages. So, um, it's uh, quite a a uh, difficult task to try and distinguish among true cognates and loan words, for example. Uh, and uh, also, sometimes people are impressed if a word sounds the same in two distantly related languages. Uh, like for example, in Thai, there are three words which sound a lot like English words. The word for uh, to die is die. Uh, mm -hmm. The word for fire is fai. The word for edge or something is rim. But that's it. There are no other examples like mm -hmm. that. So uh, it's been calculated that any two languages taken at random will have about 5% of apparent phonological similarity, phon of semantic similarity. So you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember doing, uh, I gave this talk at the uh, Kyoto Sanat Ben conference a few weeks ago. And I used the, I mentioned the word Micha for shoulder bag. And one of the questions, uh, somebody said, oh, in this language in Nepal, there's a word that sounds very much like that. It means shoulder bag, uh, must be cognate. Well, maybe, but uh, there's a lot more investigation you have to do before you can convince yourself mm -hmm. of that. First, you have to uh, reconstruct the proto little Burmese word uh, for shoulder bag, and then see if that form in the Nepal language uh, can be, um, reconstruct it to something older too, and then, then you can compare them. So it's interesting, of course, but you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we have, I think, one last question before we close. Uh, Sadaf? Sadaf has a question. Sadaf Munshi asks um, if uh, she says, thank you for a fascinating talk. I look forward to reading your memoir, and she would like to know when it's when it's going to be ready. Is it already out, or when will it be ready? Oh, I know it's uh, 
under the best of circumstances, it's going to take at least another year. Of course, um, I've I, I found other memoirs which I've read, but people spend much more time on their youth than in their on their maturity and old age, because you know, that's the formative thing. There's a saying: the child is father to the man, and one can find things in one's own character that arise from things in your youth. So that's it's the most interesting part. Um, mm. And the the later part is almost public knowledge, one's career I and mean, these publications to look at and stuff like that. So I'm not sure I'm gonna go into so much detail in the later chapters, but that remains to be seen. So it'll be at least a year or two before uh, I'm satisfied with it. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing this you know, uh, episode of your memoir with us and we're waiting to hear about the next one. And uh, um, I was wondering if there were any uh, uh, linguists now or a community, Lahu community people working on a language description and documentation. Yes, yes. In fact, a good friend of mine who used to be a student at Payap University in Northern Thailand, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was known by the name of Aaron Tun or his Burmese nickname Mao Mao, which means younger brother. Um, he, I actually was able to bring him to Berkeley for a couple of months uh, to work at Stet for a while to uh, help him transcribing some of the some of the difficult texts. And he's now back in Shan State in Burma. But of course, the uh, the situation, the political situation in Burma now is dreadful with all kinds of civil wars going on. And uh, even though he was living in Kangtung, a uh, the capital of, of, uh, of one of the big cities in Shan State. <coughs> he and his family have moved out into the country where uh, the air is better and so forth. And, but he's, he's uh, written a, uh, a full-scale study of, of Lahu in Burmese and is now oh. hope, hoping to uh, get that translated into, into English. Uh, his English is excellent and uh, his health, unfortunately, is not so great. So. Uh, one can only wish him luck in, okay. in his work. Okay. Yes, we'd love to get uh, more information on him. And the reason is, and I'm sharing this with the rest of the audience here, um, we have been fortunate to get uh, Jim's uh, text collection on Lahu. That's um, his translations, transcriptions and translations of over, I think, a thousand pages. Mary Burke is here. Mary, would you like to just say a few words about that collection? I, yeah, yeah, I um, added a link in the chat and then tried to like, as you were mentioning different things, like we were talking about agriculture, then um, sending that like audio um, to people. But um, yeah, so we've been able to get uh, four audio files, 175 audio files into the um, Corsal Archive. And what we did was just keep the uh, titles the same as they're titled in the text collection. So if you wanted to, for example, uh, let's say, yeah, like the Slash and Burn agriculture um, audio that I had shared earlier that Sandy just put again, thanks. Um, then what you can do is just search exactly that same title and then find it in the text collection and then follow along there. Um, I really recommend reading the footnotes. <laughs> they're like, that's kind of where all of the the best details are. Um, <laughs> so it'll be a really good time. Um, it's it's really long, uh, but I actually went through all of it just, you know, as the um, through the process of archiving this. Um, and I really learned a lot uh, about Lahu, but also, yes, tips, tips for field work. So I thought it was great. You mentioned you went last in 2017. Uh, yes. when you visited there. So that's the first time that I, 2017 was when I went to the field the first time with Shopna. So ah. that was a fun, a fun coincidence. Ah. Um, but yeah, I really encourage everyone to, to take a look through there. And um, there are some audio files that are not in the text collection and those are like musical ones. So that's a um, really nice opportunity to, to just hear some, some songs from the field. Uh -huh. By the way, I, I taught the villagers how to sing Frere Jacques in, uh, <laughs> as a rhyme. As yeah. a rhyme. I thought it was great. 
I tried to learn it. They they sang it in French. They sang it in, in no, English. They sang it in Lahu. I mean, I'm sorry, in Lahu, in Lahu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, 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 great. Um, so. So we are going to um, send out after this talk uh, some announcements about the text collection, about the companion audio pieces, and uh, also about Jim's uh, um, collection of field notes from his field methods classes. Right now we have the Kokoro language uh, field methods class in the archive, but we're working slowly through some of the other uh, some of the other collections that are Tibeto Burman. And hopefully by, um, you know, in, in five years or so, we will have the Jim Matisoff uh, Field Methods collection up there because they are all Berkeley students with Jim Matisoff leading them. The, the notes are brilliant and really, I think, would be of use to community members. So, Jim, we will get in touch with you through and through you uh, to this gentleman, um, Alan Thun in, in Burma, to let him know that the collection is up there and let him know that he can then let his community know if people are interested in accessing it. So this is a wonderful kind of a full circle. And uh, so we thank you for participating in the course of venture, for coming here and speaking to our audience. And um, uh, we would like to give you a round of applause for that. This is your second visit. You were here physically uh, for our second course meeting. And now we're really happy that we could bring you to the overall College of Information and University uh, and actually, globally, because we have so many people from internationally here as well and from, from other universities in Canada and the U.S. So thank you for, for being here and uh, send us more things if you'd like us to archive more. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Nice meeting you all.